We thank you for your eternal word, O oh God. We know your truth lasts forever. And men and our ideas will pass away. But your word stands forever. So we pray as we come before you to hear your word, we pray that God, you help us to come with a posture of humility before your eternal, powerful and good word to us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, forget me not. If you, some of you may recognize this flower here, it has a technical name called Meiosotis. Yeah, but it has also a common name called Forget Me Not. It's a nice, beautiful blue colored flower. It got this name because of a, a German legend. It was this knight, you know, trying to get this, uh, before he died, right, he, he tried to get this flower for his lover. And finally, he got a flower and he finally reached his lover. He breathed his last breath and he says, Forget me not. Then he died. You know, or, or he's like, this side is those C drama or, or K drama. You know, you can actually make it into a drama that well, before he dies, he, Remember me. Then he died. Oh, he's like, Oh, then people, all oh, the girls watch you cry. You know, then the husband, husband or hu boyfriend watch you were like, What's wow, you know. <laughs> You know, so it, it depends. But after after this, because of this, uh, this flower get this name called Forget Me Not. You know, and in a few countries like Netherlands or New Zealand, actually this flower is a symbol for uh, the uh, uh, Alzheimer, Alzheimer and disease, Alzheimer disease and dementia. You know, so this flower symbolizes this organization reaching out to people suffering from these diseases. You know, it's a nice and a bit of romantic uh, idea about using this flower and the name, you know, forget me not. And in fact, today's passage, uh, this whole idea of forget me not or remember me appears at least four times or five times in this passage. But this idea here is, to, in today's passage, a little bit more than just being nice and romantic. You know, so let's take a look at it, verse 1 to verse 10. The first division, remembering him, remembering God in the past. So Moses began in verse 1 and 2, commanding the Israelites to obey God's law carefully. And by obeying God's law, immediately in verse 2, he brings in the idea, is to remember God and what he has done in the past. You know, and what must they remember? Of course, the verse tells us, he said, they must remember how God brought them through the wilderness and allowed them to suffer some kind of hardship. You know, verse 3, take a look at it. I say, he, he allowed them to be hungry. Allowed them to be hungry. But the Lord has also, while allowing them to be hungry in the desert, in the wilderness, God has provided them this food called manna. You know, and uh, for some of us who are not familiar with this term called manna, uh, it was in, uh, described in Exodus when they were there. Then in the morning, they wake up, they'll see on the floor, there's this white color flick. Then they can actually pick it up and they, when they eat it, it's like, it's like melts in the mouth, it's sweet. And if you remember this description in Exodus. And, but the only uh, quote to this is that when they have taken it, they must only take for a number of households that they have in their tent. Let's say for my house, I have four persons, so I only can take for four persons portion. You know, so, and I cannot take overnight. So I have to take two more. La, nah, nah, I got so much, then take two more. Overnight, the thing will rot and actually worms will grow. Nothing. So it's like, um, it's like now, now this is our catering food, right? After three hours when it's served, right, you cannot eat anymore. I mean, they are advised not to eat anymore. Uh, uh, Moreover, with so many news about the food poisoning in Taiwan, Japan, and JB, and all this. So, so to yesterday news, one more, more food poisoning case in JB. Do you, do you read it? Yeah, so with all this kind of case, so like, uh, so it's something like this kind of idea. It's like, no, like, it's more than that. Uh, it's, it's basically no tapau. Okay, cannot tapau. Okay, so. And God provided this food for them called manna. And verse 3, look at, look at, take a look at verse 3 and verse 16. Twice it says that a food that you do not know, your fathers do not know. And because precisely they do not know, it is called manna. And manna really means, what is that? But in a nice way, like, it's not, what is that? You know, no, it's, what is that? Wow, it's exciting. You know, so this is why it's called manna. You know, and, and in, not just do they, uh, God allow them to go hungry. Verse 2 and, and verse 4 shows us that they were actually going through a 40 years journey in the wilderness. It is a harsh condition in the wilderness. And there's like no MRT, no bullet train for them to travel from 
uh, Egypt all the way to uh, the Canaan land, all from Sinai below all the way to Canaan. No, there's no, there's no transportation, so they have to walk. And they have to walk long distance under the hot sun, in harsh condition of the weather. And, but in both ways, whether they go hungry or this long travel, the Lord provided for them. If you notice there, he says, in the same way, how God miraculously provided manna, God also miraculously made their clothes intact and their clothes did not wear out after 40 years. Can you see that? And also their food, none of their food actually uh, swelled up after 40 years of traveling. So God also miraculously provide for them and uh, sustain them. So I put here in, in short, so they have to remember God's gracious provision. God's gracious provision is not something human engineered out. It's beyond them to produce that food. It's beyond them that the clothes will uh, uh, sustain them for 40 years travel and the food will not swell up. You know, it's God's gracious provision supposed to do two things to their heart. First, take a look at verse 2. is to humble their hearts. And verse 16 repeats the whole idea again. is to humble you. is to humble their hearts. You know, God gave them something that is not within their control. Can you see? The manna, the clothes, the food. It's not something within their control. Something that they cannot engineer for themselves. So this really shows that God graciously provided for them and kept for them. And by this, God is humbling them and realize, so they begin to realize that it's not everything in life. In fact, nothing in life they can really engineer to such precision that they can make themselves even healthy or wealthy or anything or smart or anything. You know, it is God's gracious provision. Second thing, in this provision, it's, do, it's supposed to do a second thing to their heart. Take a look at the verse itself. Verse 2 and verse 16 again. He says it's supposed to test their heart, to test them. You know, I put here is to expose the heart. When they, when they go through this test, the heart's condition is being exposed. You know, and so that verse 3 says, so that their heart may know that it is the Lord who takes care of them. It is, you know, it's always easy to claim, to profess that we trust God, right? When things are going well with us, when uh, everything is good, uh, when, uh, uh, well, we say we trust God and we will obey, God, o obey Him in any situation. When things are going well, we, it's easy for us to profess that. You know? But when things are not within our control, then the real heart condition will be exposed. You know, when things are difficult in your life, it could be uncertain in your life, whether it's finance, whether it is your relationship, whether it is your career path, or even your health. Maybe you have some health scare here and there. You know, then when these things really happen, what we will do, we sometimes we will tend to depend on our human wisdom and our, our own method to solve things. Then our heart condition is exposed here. You know, then the Word of God, the principle in the Word of God is easily ignored or forgotten. Then this condition, I call this, the first condition that our hearts are exposed is self-reliance. That we begin to trust our own wisdom. You know, we trust ourselves and not God's word anymore. And this is a kind of arrogance actually. But the second condition that will be exposed about our heart is that they begin to focus, when, when things are not going well, we, it shows that we, our true focus in life. And our true focus in life, it could be material needs. And we begin to see that ma these material needs are more important than God, than this eternal word itself. You know, the, the word that can give us, that inform us, that made us, the word that give us meaning and purpose in life, and in fact, the word that give us eternal life. And these things are all swept away. Can you see that? Then, then we begin to see that our heart is actually a materialistic heart. That's the condition of our heart. We are fo focusing on our physical needs, food, money, sex, or anything. You know, the immediate co comfort or immediate craving in our hearts come first. That's the second condition of heart. And I call this the self-focused heart. In any case, whether it is self-focused or self-reliant, it is a heart that is about me. It is a very proud heart. 
That's why God needs to humble their hearts. And second, going through this difficult condition, you expose what is the real condition of their heart. And when God allows Israel to go through these 40 years in the wilderness, experience some hardship and all this, God is trying to humble this arrogant, proud heart of the people. And then God, Moses urged them to like, look at what actually God is doing in verse 5. Take a look at this. He says, so that your heart may know that God is actually like a loving father disciplining their child. And or verse 16 also says this. Last part of verse 16 says, he's doing good to you. He's doing something good to you. No, so they, they, they have to remember that God has a kind and good intention in leading and, uh, them through these hard, and hard conditions in the wilderness. So what would they do if they truly understand God's kind intention? What should they do? Well, it's repeated here three times. You know, verse 1, then they'll be careful to do God's word. Verse 3, then they will know that man shall live not by bread alone, but by everything that the word of God says. That the word of God that gives them purpose in life, that define for them the purpose in life, the word of God that through it they can find life and forgiveness through this in this gracious God. And the word of God that actually teach them how to be God's people, to live as a wise nation. You know, this is... The, and verse 6 again appears three, the third time. It says, therefore, keep God's command. So if they re do remember what God is doing in their life, this will be a right response. You know, they will remember God. And by remembering God, it really means obey His word. Verse 11 have the same idea. He says, don't forget God by not keeping his commandments and statutes and law. Can you see? In, in making this, this connection, remembering God is really obedience. It's another aspect of our life with God himself. You know? And why, why does he use this word, remembering God and forget him not? You know, as use this as obedience. Well, you see, our relationship with God is multifaceted. And one of the aspects of this relationship with God is to put it in this way as to remember him. It's like someone that you respect the most and you love deeply, you will want to do something. You want to obey what he says. Or not just remembering the person fondly or romantically. You know, it's just like um, if you really love your parents uh, and, your, and you really respect your dad and mom, and when they pass on, let's say, you know, and they pass on their value to you to work hard and to have integrity. So when you're living your life, you say, yeah, that's what my late parents uh, taught me. You don't just remembering them uh, romantically. You say, oh, that's what my parents taught me, but you're still a lazy bum, you know, and you don't work hard. And you are, instead of holding on to integrity, you are just dishonest. You say, yeah, but I remember my parents taught me all this, but you don't really actually honor them in a sense. You know, so in this case, this is what verse 5 is saying. It's just like a father. Can you see the father-son relationship? It's a father disciplining, graciously, lovingly disciplining his child. And when a child remembers the father, it's a value that he stands for, the child leave it out in obedience. This is, what it, this is the whole idea here. You know, so, you, so when you, in this chapter 8, it says that when you remember God, it's not just a nice romantic idea that you watch in those K-drama, then you drop one tear, then, ah, oh, oh, it's like that. Yeah, then after you switch off the TV, then you forget already. No, it's not like that. It's like you really live in obedience to Him because you have a highest love and the highest regard and the highest respect for this God that you're worshipping. Today, there are people going around, even Christians, going around making mere profession that they do remember God and they have not forgotten Him. They may even say, oh yeah, I'm, a, I'm still a Christian, yeah, although I don't attend church anymore, or I, I, uh, I, 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 still, do the, I still believe in God, and, and yeah, I respect God, I respect Him. I, I, I never forget Him, you know, although all these years I've been living my life and, um, run, and, and, and they are running their own life and they say, oh no, 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 I, I'm not forgotten God. I'm not. This is a lie. 
this is a life to remember God and not forget Him is to live a life of obedience to Him. It's not just some nostalgia, it's not some romantic, nice thinking about, ah, oh, I still call myself Christian. My IC is still Christian. My IC there is still Christian. It's more than that. It's more than that. You know, so many of us, even when we are attending church here, we could have actually forgotten about God because we are still running our own life. We don't really respect Him, love Him, and live in obedience to Him. And it is so important because this is a proper response to God. This is a proper response to God who look at verse 7 to 10, He's going to give them a good land. A good land. If God is wicked and heartless, if this God is a tyrant, why would He prepare such a good land for them? You see, the whole description, a big portion of it, 7 to 10. You know, God, if God doesn't love them, why would, why would He even bother to discipline them as a good father would to his child? So in view of that good, fruitful, rich land, he will richly and graciously give it to them. God is actually preparing his children through this wilderness period to receive this land. You know, it's just like you watch TV again. I mean, I, I don't watch, but I, that's why I, I gather. Like, huh? If you watch TV, there is rich, maybe a K-drama. or I mean, Nowadays, people watch C-drama. So, you know, people, these rich businessmen, you know, or a king who is going to pass on his rule or his riches to his son, who is a spoiled brat. What would the king do? You know, sometimes the show will, will show that, you know, they will let, let the son go through a very difficult time. You know, to discipline him, let him take some hardship to build up his character or make sure that he has some proper integrity that is intact in him and train his character. Lah. Then at the end of the last second episode or last episode, then he finally, oh, before he died, then he passed on his wealth or his kingdom or his rule uh, to this son. Then there, it's a nice ending. Then everybody, yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that. It's something like this kind of thing. You know, the, so God let Israel go through this harsh condition in the wilderness to train his children and then after that they are prepared to go into the good land to rule on his behalf. So let me summarize this first portion for us. So the first portion is Israel must remember God's past action of his loving discipline to them to prepare them to go into the land to rule on his behalf. So that they may go hungry, remember? that they go through these 40 years of long, harsh condition of travelling in the wilderness, and so humble them. And by doing that, he actually exposed the heart condition so that they will be humble and say, I need God. And what is the right response of the children of God? Well, the right response for the children of God is to humbly accept discipline, the harsh condition and then to obey God's rule. This is truly remembering God and forget Him not. What God does or what God did to Israel physically and historically, we said before, is what He would do for the church today. So I'm going to show you a diagram to remind all of us. This diagram appeared a few times in different form, but still the same. God disciplined Israel in the wilderness is preparing them to go into the land, to live as His people. That was ancient Israel. In today's context, God still disciplined the church, His believers. But not, we may not be going through, going into the wilderness, but in our life context, Maybe finance, relationship, maybe your career, maybe your whatever. You're going through the, some difficulties in your life. But so that he's preparing us to really live as his people like his own son, Jesus himself. So that we may shine for him as his kingdom people. So I have some reflection for us here at this first part. You know, when we are facing hardship, 
or difficulties. Sometimes it could just be uncertainty of the future, health issues. How do you respond? And how you and I respond shows the condition of our heart. Two thousand, it, it, it's kind of hardship, difficulties and uncertainty may come in a, in, in a few areas I've already mentioned. It could be your finance, money. It could be your career path. What well, it could be relationship that you are involved in. Any kind of relationship, family, friends, or... But it could also be your future. It could even be life and death, like you may have some illnesses or something. It could be. How do you respond? And how you and I respond actually expose the condition of our heart. And there are two type of conditions. Either you are proud, you'll be so self-reliant on yourself, you think of some worldly values and wisdom that you have gathered all this while, and you will apply them. And the law of God is kicked out. Or you'll be so self-focused, it's about you, so self-centered, and you forget that man does not live by bread alone. But your focus will be on your immediate need, immediate bread, immediate con is, uh, uh, issues in at hand. Or you could respond in another way, which is in humility, you trust the Father's heart that there's a good God who cares for you. And you humbly take His word and you submit yourself under the authority of His Word, and you live it out in obedience. Our response to uncertainty and difficulty shows the condition of our heart. And many times, we sin, because the sinful condition of our hearts are just prideful. That's the condition of our heart. We are just prideful. You know, we can be coming to church, but our heart condition could be one that is far away from God and have already forgotten Him. If you are honest, I hope we are all here honest here, we fail God most of the time. Yes, I know I do. We fail God most of the time. We are more like the Israelites than less like the Israelites. We are actually more like Him, more like them. You know, and when things don't go our way, and things be, we go through kind of a harsh condition in the wilderness, uncertainty and difficulty. What are the common responses? I put a few here. We complain. Yala, my job la lousy la, like boss. So far away. Yala, the weather so hot. I mean, all of us are complaining about weather now. La. You know. We, or we become angry at people. Or we become jealous. You know. Wow, that kind of face can also find husband. Ah. Wow, my this kind of face should find five husband really by now. You know, we will be jealous about other people. Well, that kind of skill can also drive a big car. I should be driving a Rolls Royce really. Oh, we are so jealous about other people. Or we blame others. And we blame the situation. And deep in our hearts, we also blame God. You should give me something better. You know better. You know I deserve more, right? So we actually, in our hearts, we also blame Him. Or we quickly turn to our own wisdom and we begin to depend on our own wisdom. You know, and or we sulk and act like we are the victim. And we are so self-focused. We victimize ourselves. And suddenly, the whole entire doctrine of the sovereignty of God is thrown out the window. Suddenly, God is not in control anymore. Our sovereignty, doctrine of sovereignty is out, is washed out, is flushed down the toilet. Or maybe at the back of my mind, we still think, that, yeah, la, God is sovereign. La. But maybe God is not that wise. Maybe He's sovereign, but maybe God is not that loving after all. Maybe even a bit sadistic. You know? So our doctrine begins to wobble. And we are not humble at all before Him. Not humble at all. Just like the Israelites who failed God 
again and again, and throughout the whole history, if you read through, you have read through Exodus and Numbers and to now Deuteronomy, you realize that they have been complaining, grumbling, and using their own wisdom. The Israelites as a nation was a lousy representation of God among all the unbelieving nations. When all the unbelieving nations, pagan nations, look at Israelites, they're like, same as us, what? as stupid as us. No difference. In fact, maybe more foolish than us. You know, they have no difference. And so Moses is telling the Israelites, guys, remember God. But thanks be to God because many, many, many years after Moses and Israel, there was a better representation. Someone who would humbly obey God's law and His word, and it never failed him. And someone is our Lord Jesus Christ, the true representation of God. Let me show you a verse here in the New Testament, a passage. Here. Jesus Himself was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Can you see the, 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 the parallel here? He was led by the devil into, sorry, led by the Spirit into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. And Jesus fasted 40 days, 40 nights. Can you see a parallel again? There was a 40 years and there was a 40 days, 40 nights. And he was hungry. Remember Israel also was hungry? And the tempter said to him, if you are the son of God, come on. You can do it. You, you have the right to do it. Why? You are the son of God. Tell these stones. Turn them into bread. Because you're hungry. Come on, God won't blame you. If God does, he, He's not understanding. Just turn the stone into bread. Use your wisdom, Jesus. That's what the devil is telling him. What did Jesus say? Well, the second part, which all, all of us are very familiar with, Jesus answered the devil. He says, it is written, and Jesus quote from Deuteronomy 8. He says, Man shall not live by bread alone. It's important. Bread and butter, money is important. But you can eat. In John chapter 6 says, They ate the bread and they still die. And they perish in hell. So man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus has none of this. He will not want to use his own wisdom to solve the situation, turning the stone into bread. No. Neither will he want to focus merely on physical needs, craving, which is his fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He, neither would he want to focus merely on a physical need. He's neither self-reliant nor self-focused. Jesus is a true and better representative for, G for God. Jesus truly remember God and never forget Him. Of course, none of us sitting here can do that, can be like Jesus. That's why Jesus didn't stop there. He went to the cross to die for your forgetfulness and my forgetfulness so that through that we can receive forgiveness of our sins. Praise be to God. So that any one of us in this room can put our faith in this true representative and then receive that forgiveness and learn then to not to forget God and to remember Him by the power of His Spirit. If you know that you have failed God, you have forgotten Him in your life, if you know that deep in you, you can also put your faith in Jesus so that you will not forget God through Him. And you have not done so. If you have not done so, anyone here, you can express that desire or that faith through a simple prayer. I just write a simple prayer like this. You can just tell God, say, God, I'm so proud all this while in my life. Self-reliant, self-focused. 
and I need help. Thank you for Jesus who come in full humility and obedience and die for my forgetfulness so that I can receive your forgiveness. I believe that in him, he died for me on the cross. Please save me and help me live in obedience to you and never to forget you. Amen. You can express a simple prayer like this and place your faith in Jesus. Just like the Israelites many years ago, they were not only to remember what God had done for them in the past, in the wilderness, they are also warned about the future good time to come. So that is the, the second part of our passage here. Forget him not in the future, verse 11 to verse 20. Again, Moses warned Israel not to forget God by not keeping his commandment. Verse 11, he says, don't forget him by not keeping his commandment. You know? And the, the difference is this, in the earlier part, is that they are not to, God was preparing them before they entered the land. The difference is that this second part here is to warn them that when they are inside the land already. Verse 12 says, when you have eaten, you are satisfied, you grow your crops, your herbs, herds, and they all multiply, your children, your wealth, your gold and silver, they are all multiplying. And, your, and verse 14 says, when then your heart will be proud. It's a warning against them that when they are in the land and they are settled. And verse 17 says, then your pride, proud heart will say, it's by my power and my might that I built all these things for myself, all my wealth. Okay. So you see, the first paragraph here in this chapter says it's the hardship, right, and uncertainty, right, in the wilderness, right, as a way to test the Israelites and to expose their heart. But the interesting thing is the second part here tells us that when things are comfortable and we are successful, it's also a way to show something about our hearts, isn't it? So I just put here, so the comfortable and successful situation is also a way to show man's self-glorifying heart. It's still a proud heart. It's me. I've achieved this for myself by my own wisdom, own power, own might, I make myself successful. Somehow I read the Bible harder than other people. Somehow I pray longer on my knees. That's why I'm a mature Christian. You know, some, sometimes we think that like, because I give more, you know, that's why I'm like that today. So it's a proud heart, actually. When things are comfortable, things are successful, it also shows the condition of our heart. It's a self-glorifying heart. So some people may be sitting here and think, wow, very hard. Uh. Harsh condition is to test and to humble them. But it shows that the Israelites' hearts are proud. Good time, comfortable situation is also dangerous. They are shown to be complacent and proud. So hard time is dangerous. Good time is also dangerous. So what should I do? Well, the problem is not really the conditions that we are in. I put here, the problem is not the situation, whether it's a rough situation in the wilderness or comfortable situation in Canaan. The real problem is a prideful human heart. That is the real problem. Do you and I, do we recognize this? That the real problem is the heart, not the condition. So it's not that, oh, when I have more money, uh, things will be better. Oh, okay, la, I'm so rich now, I become proud. I mean, when I have less money, it will be better. No, no, no. It's not about that. When I'm stronger or healthier, uh, uh, I'll be better. Oh, okay, la, don't be so strong. La. Maybe I can now want sickness. I'll be hum more humble. No, it's not about that. It's not when you are smarter or when you are less smart, situation will be solved. They will not be solved. The real saving that we need is not to change our parents, not to change our siblings, change our friends, our bosses, our spouse, or our neighbour. 
the real change and the real rescue that we need is a rescue of us from our heart. That's a real rescue that we need and only God can do that. How should we do? Well, in this passage here, it tells us three times how to deal with this prideful human heart. Verse 1 to 2 says, Be careful to obey the Lord. Remember Him. Verse 11 says, Don't forget God by not keeping His commandment. And it ends off in the passage says, Well, you will perish if you stop listening or you stop obeying the law of God. So the only way to do, to humble us, whether in good situation or bad situation, is to learn to, in humble submission to the Word of God. So I'm just suggesting that three things that we can do or three things that we can ask ourselves as we go through life situation in some implication. So when your, when your times are good or bad, you always ask yourself, what does the good and gracious Word of God have to inform me about this situation? Good situation or bad situation? What does the word, how should the word of God inform me to think about this situation? And you must recognize the word of God is good. And the word of God is gracious. It's Father's word to the child. Second, how can I respond to a situation according to God's loving principle? Maybe you have a harsh spouse, colleague, boss, Neighbor, then you ask, how should I respond to this situation according to God's loving principle? Or maybe when you are so tempted to use your own wisdom and human wisdom that you, you want to tackle some situation in your life, you have to ask, you have to tell yourself that God's word is infinitely wiser than me. And what attitude or mindset or behavior should I change? When we keep our focus, if you look at these three questions, when we keep our focus, it's always on how the Word of God ought to inform me, how the Word of God ought to change me, how the Word of God should help me see things from His perspective. When we submit ourselves under the Word of God, we begin to deal with our proud heart more and more, in humility, prayerfully, of course. Let me summarize this passage here. Moses urged God's people to remember God. Forget Him not. To remember Him. And what does it mean to remember Him? is to obey Him. Because by obeying Him is a sure guard against our prideful heart. It's either self-reliant on our own wisdom, self-focused on focusing on just merely the present needs, craving that we have, and self-glorifying, giving ourselves all the glory. some time to think about this and after that Derek will close us in closing song.